very start, of course, the dungeon was a little bit more difficult. Then Blizzard made some changes to the dungeons, uh, especially like. For example, those small droplets are not affected by undeath affixes, something like bursting or uh, bolstering. So that definitely helps in this sense. So right off the bat, we're seeing two massive pulls. One actually slightly bigger on the side of Abracadabra. Divinefield went out and pulled the padding mobs on both the left and the right side. Nerf only grabbed the right mobs on the side of Method NA. Now, we did see both teams actually had leave one DPS back with the Shrine Templar to interrupt his damage reduction aura. So that's why they're able to efficiently AOE all of this down. But at the same time, all of these mobs, you have to make sure you're coordinating your interrupts very efficiently. Yeah, it's crucial that this buff doesn't go through because they don't have a Demon Hunter for an offensive dispel, and they're playing Alliance, right? So they don't have the Blood Elf dispel either, so it's very crucial that they interrupt all of these abilities that leave a buff on them behind. Now, we see both of those teams did pop their Lalas for this uh, big pull on the st at the start, and we see uh, Abracadabra already being done and on the way to the, to the next pull. It is super efficient movement. Finish the trash pack, which they pulled more of and finished first, instantly Shroud Skip straight down to the boss trash. This is super efficient, and I'm probably we're probably going to see them proc reaping here and pull it either into the boss or maybe Shadow Mother. We're not sure yet. If you see Method and a, uh, doing some doing a different pull coming uh, coming out of them, they actually saw uh, we had Nerf uh, throwing and pulling them up from downstairs, pulling them upwards. Now I assume they pull enough trash here to trigger the reaping. Now this is usually what we see on live servers. If you do really high shrine keys, you try to trigger the reaping at this spot where they are right now because you can hide behind the stairs to get all those caster mobs closer to you. Because on this pull, on this very first reaping, the first 20%, there's an insane amount of caster mobs. And if they're all spread out without like the possibility of a blood decay or any mass grip, it's gonna be very difficult to deal with them. Yeah, we also saw a similar pull strategy in the other NAEU matchup earlier today when they were on Shine. Learn to Fly also made pulled a lot of trash before the first boss in the EU group. Uh, I forget who it was. They instantly went to this went to the first boss, similar to what Abracadabra is doing. We did see they skipped all of that all of that first reaping wave with Shadow Mode and also used the Shroud to go straight to the first boss. So, really, just kind of a time difference. They're pulling the first boss later, and it's just I mean they just lost a little bit of time, about 30% on the boss here. Yeah, so I believe that this is pull because as we've just seen, they, they ran past in the Shadow Mountain, so they did the, the trigger the Reaping on top to be able to run down and actually skip this Reaping wave. Now, some of the Reaping mobs, like a couple of them still walked up to them, but there's still a lot of Reaping mobs safe. Now, on the other hand, though, Abracadabra did proc their Reaping downstairs on the bus, and they just had all the Reaping come to them, or most of it at least, that they didn't manage to Shadow Melt, and just kill it on top of the bus. Now, we did mention this a little bit earlier, but not only do Unholy DKs benefit a lot from having AoE for single target, but Outlaw Rose actually have a trait that they can run that will give them a little bit of extra single target damage as well. So pulling that Reaping into the bus just for the Outlaw Rogues is a little bit of extra single targeted damage as well. And we see them already going into the first phase, and they're using the safer strat. They're DPSing one of the Aqualings down first if they only have to deal with two of the Aqualings rushing at the same time rather than three. And they all dodge it perfectly, of course. Yeah, now this boss is actually kind of difficult, uh, especially on Tyrannical. Now we do have Fortified here, so they should be able to deal with the mechanics just fine. But uh, there's a very high possibility of someone actually falling off the platform if they get hit by the Surging Rush, especially once the boss splits up into three smaller elementals and each of them casts the Surging Rush. Now the damage you can probably survive that hits you if you get hit by it, but the way it just knocks you, you might be able to you might be falling off the platform and sometimes you're unrestable if you fall down so it's very crucial to dodge the, those abilities now we've seen these teams do a bunch of different strats after this first boss goes down some of them will just skirt along the side and make sure they just run past some teams will use their, se will use their second shroud to go straight to the hallway one of them definitely the shroud is definitely a little safer we've only seen the two rogue teams be able to pull it off because they need to have two shrouds to do that but both both of these teams have two rogues, so I don't think we should see too much of a different strategy here. Abracadabra, like we said, using that shroud right there to move straight to the hallway pack where their tank will run in, pull all of the non-mini boss mobs, and pull them back out so they can AOE them down. Now, we, we do see a difference uh, in trash percentage here. Um, Abracadabra at 23% right now before this pull, and Method and Ace actually in 27% because they did this um, pull higher up. Now, it seems like Abracadabra is ahead, but they're actually really even when it comes to trash percentage uh, and time. Yeah, I'm not really sure about, I mean, that's definitely a possibility, right? But in this mob-rich dungeon, there's so many things that you can pull efficiently. I'm not sure if that 3% extra mob Maybe. count is gonna yeah. be as much as the one minute they lost on this first boss here. 
Yeah, maybe. We will see how it turns out for them later. Uh, the reaping timing, of course, is also going to be different now for both of those teams. So maybe Method and A does have a better reaping strat later on. Maybe Abercrombie has. We will see what happens later. But we see Abercrombie um, still being on this pretty big pull that they did actually here. They're still working on it. Uh, of course, we see the tank kiting backwards because there's uh, a lot of muffs that they pulled and we have of course raging as well so once the muffs are very low hp we they do have one raster druid or a druid in general who can dispel the raging debuff off of one muff but it does have a 10 second cooldown so of course once all the muffs reach reaching at uh, raging at the same time the healer is not able to dispel them all so the tank is kiting backwards and once again we're probably going to see this team here run through all the way through past the mini boss we see divine field sticking behind just to make sure they stay in one spot and they're all going to pop shadow meld together here on Q. Go. There you go. All shadow melded. <laughs> Aggro gone. They're clean through. They're going to go ahead and pull all of the trash they want here for mob count. Yeah, you see a method in A side. Uh, they did a very similar pull, I assume. They pulled everything back up, though, to, to have more space out there to kite, which is like, as I said, every small thing matters here. So the fact that they had to pull, to go in, pull the mobs, and pull them back out, while on the other side, Ibrahim Deva just ran in and pull and killed them up where they are just it, it might just be a couple of seconds that you lose from this backtracking but since those teams are so close to one another every single second just counts we keep harping on the small things like you said one d one death is just five seconds still but even even backtracking just a little bit like they did there maybe it's safer for them maybe they feel like they can't do it without that but it's just backtracking just that little bit even though you're dpsing the entire time movement through the dungeon is important the best teams have the cleanest movement from, from trash to trash. You'll see the tanks almost instantly move, pull into the next pack. We also saw such EV get one shot there by <laughs> one of the mobs. Murph didn't, Murph didn't pick it up there, but fortunately he doesn't go down. And they are going to move through and hopefully Shadow Mode. Looks like they didn't get the meld off, unfortunately. Okay, so actually all of the mobs are coming in. This means it's probably a full group wipe coming out of Method and A here because the, the mini boss did not reset, meaning all of them are gonna die. They do not have a battle rest. This means they actually need to release. They need to have all of them release and go back. I'm not exactly sure what they're gonna do now. I'm not sure why it wasn't just JB and one of the rogues release. Oh, it's because of the reaping. Okay, so they did skip this reaping earlier, as we mentioned, with uh, Shadow Melt. Now, if JB and the rogue release only, they add the reaping mobs, of course, because they do have true sight, so you can't sell fast it. So this is disastrous for Method and A here. They all have to release, they have to backtrack, they have to kill the reaping that they skipped earlier, and then they have to do the skip one more time, which is just like so much time lost for them here. Yeah, we saw the same thing happen in this dungeon earlier, but unfortunately the rest of the was able to make sure he got away Shadow Melt himself, and he was able to uh, res his group. Unfortunately, JB wasn't able to do it there because the mobs were too close to them on the bridge and they were already in, ag in aggro radius of the reaping mobs. So unfortunately, this is like worst case scenario. They're gonna have to backtrack through the entire dungeon. They're gonna have to deal with that second reaping wave that they were trying to skip with Shadow Meld because the aggro radius, it, they won't be able to get through the hallway undetected. It's just, it's just impossible. This is probably like almost five minute time waste here. So as long as Abercrombie doesn't have anything disastrous happen, they should just be clean selling all the way to the rest of the dungeon as we see them already engaged with the second boss and they already have it at about 60%. Yeah, this is a very big problem, especially in Shrine, because you do always, or almost always spawn at the entrance unless you're at the very last boss. So the fact that there's so many things that you skip with Shroud and Shadow Melt and whatnot, if you do have a full group wipe, as you saw coming in here, it's just an insane amount of time lost because of all of this happening. So now we switch to Abercadabra. If they have a kill, uh, clean run from now on, they should be able to pull it off. So they are here on the second boss, which uh, we talked about earlier, but it's actually quite difficult to deal with if uh, you're not properly handling uh, the interrupts. Right, so the, ma the main premise of this boss is you want to make sure you DPS, Gale Call, or Fade Down as quickly as possible. She'll cast Wind Burst at the group, which will put debuffs on people, making them take more, dam more damage from Wind Burst. So, as long as you're interrupting at least every single one, especially with the triple melee comp, that's pretty easy to do. Even if you let one of them through, it's going to be fine. The problem comes when you, when you let three or four of them through. That's when your group will start wiping. They do get Gale Call, Fade Down, and all they have to do is deal with Brother Ninehole. Now, we have seen some groups once scale caller Fey is down, they'll tend to have their healer maybe run down and pull some more trash mobs up. So I'm interested to see if they do that here. Yeah, we actually see also at the being away, he probably pulls some mobs right here as we see them coming running up uh, as well. So as we said earlier, this boss is not very difficult if he's alone. So you can just pull trash on top of it as long as you don't have any affixes preventing you from doing so, like bolstering. And you can just be more efficient killing those mobs on top of the boss. Now, of course, this is uh, more tank damage and more damage to, to deal with for the healer and more control that you need. But we, 
I'm pretty sure those teams can handle this. I mean, this is almost kind of like resurrecting Gale Caller Fade. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> you don't have a mob to interrupt anymore. Here's another one. Keeps your ritualist. <laughs> Make sure you get the Shadow Bolt Volley interrupts, or the, sorry, the Unending Darkness. It's the same thing. Or <laughs> your group's going to take a lot of damage. Now, we seem to have been struggling to just pretty much get back at where they started because as i said earlier they're just missing those traps they're missing the shadow melts because now all of a sudden they have to do all at once so now they have to pull something that they were not meant to pull in their route so they have to pull those small maps um that are around the minibus then they have to jump on the left side because i assume they just do not have their shroud ready or they need it later so just still struggling to get back on track here yep they'll need that shroud later to get past the uh Tight element. Well, actually, no, they can't use try to get past the tight element. They're going to probably have to use a tank death there. Just re well, no, their shadow modes are actually back up. It doesn't matter. Either way, they're not going to use their shot there. They're going to save their shot for later in the dungeon and to be able to get through that. We do see Abracadabra getting the second boss down and moving on in prob into probably the most dangerous pack in the dungeon, the triple the triple enforcer pack. They actually pulled five enforcers. They pulled five yes, enforcers. Yes, five enforcers. He's going to be kiting like crazy. Yes. <laughs> now, that's a good thing, again, about uh, the utility of a monk. We see just this ring of peace coming out. Now, if you think about Typhoon, right, it, it uh, knocks the, ba the mobs back one time. Now, Ring of Peace, on the other hand, it keeps knocking them back for the whole duration. Now, this is very important, not only for resetting Necrotic and things like that, but for those very dangerous pulls where you have just five and fours that are just hitting the tank with just an insane amount of damage. So we see the people just running in a circle, putting down a Ring of Peace, having uh, having the rogues help out with CC, having a stand there, and so on, just to, for him to be able to not get hit by those enforcers at all. Yeah, and he can't get hit by these enforcers at all. They're yeah. all raging. Anything, any, any two melees, he's probably gone. So very good kiting from Divinefield here. I mean, Divinefield's no stranger to kiting. Definitely not. Uh, Divinefield, of course, uh, was part of Shell's Angels, the winning team of last year. And we see Elsarat actually dying here. Now, this is a very big problem because Elsarat cannot be rest unless they're out of combat because they do not have engineering. That means they can't have the knives to rest him, and none of them have a battle rest. So they need to deal with this uh, without having anyone die because Elsarat can't release, right? Because else we have the same problem with Method and Ace side. So now they need to deal with this Reaping Wave. Uh, without the healer which means the minefield has to cut of course and then of c thankfully they have a windwalker who can rest elsewhere at once to get out of combat now they're on a clock here this is a grievous dungeon they have to make sure they get through this combat and kill all the trash so that they can get a fish feast down to instantly heal before they all die to grievous we saw ashine's cloak already procced dr j said 100 percent so as long as he doesn't take any more damage, he should be fine. But Swagfist cannot die, right? Yes. He's Swag crucial to survive right. because he's the only one who can rest. So as long as Swagfist survives, they're fine. They've got the feast down ahead of them. They dropped a new okay, one there. Okay, perfect. They're totally fine. They're, they're going to be able to get Elsa right up. And I mean, that, that was almost it. That was almost the disastrous thing that needed to happen to get Method today back in this game. Now, that is going to cost Abracadabra probably about a minute and a half, two minutes, because all the time they spent wasted kiting around, one DPS dead, not efficient at all. Unfortunately, on the side of Method Ane, we saw Shakib go down on the second boss there, but they did have a battle res. Now, they have... Okay, they managed to get everyone back up. They did recover. Now, of course, their mindset, of course, on Method and A side, they are going to know they are behind, right? They lost so much time from this crucial wipe, so they will know they are behind. They probably have... Uh, they're not on the best mindset at this point around. We might see some mistakes that they wouldn't do otherwise, but... As we saw on their side, if Abracadabra does make a mistake, which almost happened there, they almost had a wipe or had to release there, then Abracadabra is going to lose the same amount of time, if not even more, than Method and A did. So if Method and A keeps a clear hat, they keep doing what, they, what they're doing, and they have a good mentality, and if Abracadabra does something wrong, they actually might be able to catch up here. I mean, we have had dungeons in the, in the past where teams were this far behind, even more behind than this, and they were able to come back because the team ahead, to the team ahead, were able, they made more mistakes than the team behind. I recall a dark heart thicket where that happened. <laughs> it was. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> so you see, Eric and I did a shadow skip here again. So they, we saw this a couple of times earlier where they they pulled this tentacle group and they pulled this uh, patrol group on top which is a very difficult group to handle we saw some groups earlier even use balas for this pull but we see Abracadabra saving it for now now there's some uh, difficult mechanics uh, that this trash bag suit that you have to deal with as we see this frontal ability that you need to dodge out of LC gets stunned uh, which of course uh, especially tank uh, can't get hit by that ability and we have those ripped mine casts that need to be somehow interrupted are very scary for the tank as well so uh, <laughs> we see more deaths coming in for Method and A unfortunately yeah very unfortunate but they did get the boss down at least and their healer is alive so they are going to be able to res as long as they get the melt off here 
But it looks like they're still in combat, unfortunately. So we'll see. We'll see if they're able to recover the, from that. But for now, let's keep a look, keep, keep an eye on Abracadabra as they go down the bridge towards the third boss. They are using their shroud to skip this patrol. I'm interested to see whether or not they're going to proc their 80% their reaping before they go to the boss, or if they're going to go straight through to the boss. It looks like they're going to proc it here. Yeah, so they're probably going to proc the reaping from this whole tentacle room. Then they either choose to kill it with the boss, or they kill it with another trash bag behind, because they do need a little bit more percentage. Oh, so they actually didn't proc reaping, so they have to kill one more thing. So they're probably going to kill the tentacles here. They either uh, kill the reaping with the boss, or they pull one more trash bag from the back and kill it on top of the reaping, because, of course, you do need a certain amount of percentage before you go to the last boss room, because there's only so much trash in this room, and if you don't have enough, it's very difficult difficult to go back, right? Now, I didn't see if someone actually went down to proc the uh, RP before they killed the tentacles. I don't think they did. And that's just a little bit lazy. It's like a 10-second loss, but at the same time, they're so far ahead, they probably don't really care about that too much. So let's get into Lord Storm's song. He's so. one of those bosses that pretty much, it's just one of the interrupt rotation bosses. You can have a two melee interrupt rotation on the boss to make sure that you get every single void bolt cast. And in addition to that, you also have the purple orbs to deal with. Yeah, the purple orbs spawn uh, and chase one player each. So five orbs for five players, everyone's chasing one. Now, uh, sometimes the boss will mind controlled one player randomly, and this player needs to get damage. As we see, Swagfist here being mind controlled, uh, he does need to reach approximately 50% HP to get out of this mind control. So he walks into those orbs that damage him, and if it's not enough, then you need the players to get him out, or the player who is mind controlled can actually jump into this pool in the back, which is a bit dangerous, though. Yeah, and we almost, we almost saw him getting, uh, getting that cast off there, which has been really unfortunate. But like you said, the, purple, the, the mind control person needs to get DPS'd out if there are only five orbs. Usually when you have two or three sets of orbs up, they can break themselves out by running into them. In addition to all of those mechanics, Lord Stormtown will occasionally cast Rip Mind, which is just a single target random player nuke. We'll do probably 40 to 50% of their health on this level. It's not too dangerous because it doesn't cast it back to back, but if somebody doesn't get healed, especially on this Grievous Hafix, they, they could go down to that. And unfortunately, they did lose their 50-50 because uh, the very first mind control, I'm, I'm pretty sure both of the rogues used their Cloak of Shadows in case if they would if they would have gotten targeted by that ability, it just wouldn't have happened at all. But they lost the 50-50 and uh, Swagfest actually got targeted instead of the rogues. And then they didn't have their Cloak ready again, so Dr. J got the second mind control as well. And once again, they get one more set of five purple orbs, but they're probably not going to have to deal with them as they deal with the last 5% on Lord Stormsong. Once they're done with this boss, they'll head through the underwater gauntlet of jellyfish. Hopefully not get stunned, because we'll clip that too. <laughs> and make it right to the last boss room. Now, we saw them waiting here. Now, uh, at the very end when the boss dies, there's a small RP event that uh, this pool actually does damage if you jump in. But once you kill the boss, it actually gets removed and you can uh, safely uh, swim through this water. So <laughs> people need to make sure they don't jump into the pool too early, because else they might just die. Yeah, I seem to recall a clip of uh, Sauros doing some dungeons with some PvPers and <laughs> him telling them to jump in right away. That was pretty toxic. <laughs> that is pretty toxic. Now but get, <laughs> get stunned! Oh, what are you doing? A shine! He tried to cloak it, too. Oh, I you like to zoom in, though. That. I like the camera zoom in. That's perfect. It's a good one. <laughs> yeah, zoom in right up for the, clo the selfie close-up <laughs> on that stun there. Now, when they get into this room, we're probably going to see them. Maybe they, We've seen teams to do, to do two different things. They might pull two eel packs before the boss, or they might just go straight to the boss. And of course, we've seen every single group in this dungeon use the healer damage buff to their advantage in the trash while the boss is still alive. Yeah, is he then pulling two packs here? Sometimes people choose to shroud through this pack because uh, people tend to pull those eels when they're swimming past, even if they don't intend to. So sometimes we see the rogue just shrouding, uh, everyone swimming through, making sure they get to the boss and then come back once they have the buff. But we, we saw the team, uh, we, so we see Abrakidabra here pulling two groups and now going to the boss. Maybe they're waiting for Kulans to come up, back up or to just have uh, less eels to, to kill later on. In terms of mechanics of boss, the, the, the upstairs phase isn't really that difficult. He'll occasionally put void zones on the ground, and in the uh, the next phases, he'll also spawn adds that will slowly move towards the boss. But in this first phase, you're pretty much just trying to do as much damage as possible before he goes into the intermission phase. Yeah, so in the mission phase, uh, the tank and the healer will get pulled in a different realm as the DPS. So the three DPS are in one realm and the healer and the tank are in a different realm. In the tank healer realm, there will be one big add that the tank needs to uh, tank or kite, depending on what he chooses. Now, of course, the healer has uh, the debuff, which increases his uh, damage done and decreases his maximum HP. So the healer needs to be careful to not pull aggro because healers... Uh, 
already generate more aggro right than a normal melee uh, dps would do so healers on top of having healing aggro they also have damage aggro from this buff so you have to be very careful so the map doesn't turn around just one shot you right especially in this raging fx after they get all their damage out and aoe all the eels down they gonna need to make really 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 sure that they don't get turned and smacked when they're raging because that's going to be an instant one shot especially on this difficulty most definitely now we see um in the DPS realm, let's talk about that real quick. There's two tentacles, uh, two mobs, I mean, that cast one long ability, and they need to be interrupted. If they're not being interrupted, they consume essence, then they will heal to full HP, and they will do an AoE damage on the whole group. So it's very important that this ability is being interrupted. Of course, LC boosts a lot of time, and you might even just wipe or kill your healer, because this AoE damage might not kill... Um, their DPS or the tank, but it's definitely going to kill the healer because of this debuff that just reduces their uh, max HP. Yeah, and we see the actual damage increase we get from the healer almost keeping up with the DPS, and actually in some of the previous times we saw them do more damage than DPS. I mean, elsewhere it's probably not expecting to as much damage, might not have d DPS trickets on, we can go over that for ages. But they do go back to the boss, all they really have to do now is single target the boss down, dodge the tentacles on the ground, and make sure that they keep these small adds that move towards the boss CC'd and away from the boss. If they do hit the boss, they'll give him more mana, and if the boss reaches 100 mana, he'll go into another intermission phase, which means they'll have to do an entire another intermission phase, which is just extra time. Yeah, and if you kill those uh, muffs before they reach the boss, they will actually do a splash AoE on the whole group. But this AoE actually doesn't do so much damage, so if you kill them one by one, then Elsred will probably be able to just heal himself back up, and they will probably not one-shot him. But we see them just opting to kite the boss around, just making sure they don't reach the boss at all, so they don't have to kill them. We see the Ring of Peace coming down here, and we see the boss dying. Yeah, once again, the boss goes down. All they have to do now is deal with the remaining eel packs in the room, and they're home free. Now, once again, these eel packs aren't free. They will turn and hit random people in melee range if they're closer than the tank, and in addition to that, it is reaping. So having 18 of these re these raging eels able to turn and hit melee, it's, it's not exactly easy. Definitely not. We see Divine Field here having this debuff that the eels stack up on each auto attack, kind of like the reaping mobs, and it does do a lot of damage, especially when they, as you see, uh, Divine Field dropping so much because they're raging, and Dr. J almost dying there. Thank God he's a rogue and has a lot of utility and cheat death. And they get it done. <laughs> Mother load once again, new girl. We're gonna see a lot more bot kills. Most likely. So we're probably just gonna see a lot of trash being pulled and killed at this very start. But there's one different thing we actually see here from Abra Kadebra. We saw both teams earlier do who did mother load skipping past this trash with shroud. Uh, and we also see Method and A skipping it, while Abra Kadebra actually chooses to, to kill this trash here at the start. Yeah, and they specifically picked out all of the non off duty laborers using all of their available CC. So this means they're planning on doing a big pull, probably with lust. To, to make sure that they don't get too many high bolstering stacks on these bombs. Yeah, they actually were very fast with all the CC coming out. They had double sap, double blind coming out of the two rogues, and immediately as soon as it opened, they were managed to, to do this pull with the CC coming out, not getting any of those bolstering stacks. Now we see uh, a pull coming out of Arachidebra with a Peacekeeper, and as we mentioned before, those Peacekeepers just have so much more HP than uh, all the other trash in this area, so they need to make sure to just single target the Peacekeeper, and once they're about the same HP, then they can start AoEing, while also having to control all those cast their mobs uh, at the same time. Now this is definitely a smaller pull with Bloodless than we saw from the other teams previously in the dungeon that used their shroud to get all the way to the inner ring. We saw Method and A do something almost exactly similar. They pulled about eight or so off to do laborers, the lower HP mobs, killed them off first with CC, and they also went into a large pull with Bloodless. This is a little bigger though. This is that same triple Peacekeeper pull that we saw earlier. Yeah, this is interesting though because one of the Peacekeepers arrived really late. So now both of the both of the, the existing key Peacekeepers are approximately 50-40% HP, while the new Peacekeeper came in with 100% HP. Now they have to deal with all those mobs keeping them alive, all those fucks that are charging around, all those mobs that they need to interrupt, while also simultaneously not trying to AOE anything because if this one last Peacekeeper that came in gets bolstered, then he's going to have a lot of HP. In. Now the strategies we've seen in Motherload are pretty similar so far. Generally speaking, most groups will get almost all of their trash percentage in between the first, first and second boss and before the first boss specifically. Now, it wouldn't actually surprise me if these, these teams actually took the time to watch the last Motherload match we had, and maybe they could have even crafted their strats a little bit around that, because in general, the trash pulls in this dungeon are pretty limited. You're going to pull almost all of the trash before the first boss, and then you're going to have to make up the rest of the percentage somewhere else in the dungeon, usually between the first and the second boss. So they could have seen the way that one of the groups pulled the trash, 
and they could have they could have liked it and said, okay, we'll do that. So we did see a similar pull, like I said, from Method and A, where they pulled the three peacekeepers, which is the exact same thing that both both of the previous groups did. Yeah, definitely wouldn't be surprised to see stuff like that here. Um, we see Arakidera and uh, are behind in track percentage, so NA already procs their first reaping, while Arakidera is on 17% just now as they killed those last peacekeepers. Now they're procking their reaping too. So they're still ahead on head. They both uh, have pulled, they both used Bloodlust earlier on a bigger pull before, but uh, they're gonna stay here for a while. They're gonna proc a lot more reaping on, in this area here. Oh, they're gonna be here for probably the next 10 minutes or so, making yeah. sure they get all the trash mob percentage down, making sure they proc every single mechanized peacekeeper that they possibly can, and just doing as much as they can in this section of the dungeon because the trash in the rest of the dungeon, like we've mentioned so many times, is way too difficult to deal with. Yeah, the, we mentioned this earlier that most people just choose to pull this trash uh, because the later trash is so difficult to deal with, but bolstering makes this very hard. So usually on live servers, when it's a bolstering reek, uh, people tend to or to avoid this dungeon because of this fact that the peacekeepers just have so much more HP than the rest. But uh, they can't choose their affixes here, so they have to play this dungeon, and they still choose to just do this early part of the of the dungeon with the peacekeeper, and they just need all this single target DPS and this focus damage to be able to deal with the bolstering, and they're doing a good job so far. Now, we've mentioned these peacekeepers several times, and there's a reason that they're so important to the strategies. In these dungeons, there's only one or two peacekeepers that are patrolling around. The way that these teams are getting so many peacekeepers is they're pulling mech jockeys. Now, the first thing a mech jockey will do the second you pull is they'll instantly scramble towards their mech, as you can see on the side of Method and A on the left side, and they'll start casting Activate Mech. What that will do will get them to jump into a peacekeeper. And the reason this is beneficial is because while the mech jockey only gives you about 1.5% mob count, the peacekeeper gives you 4%, and it's easier to deal with because all it does is tank damage, really. So we see them pulling as many of these peacekeepers as humanly possible in this dungeon. Yeah, and the, peace uh, the, the jockey jumps into the peacekeeper, and you actually get the percentage from the jockey, too, when you kill the peacekeeper. So as long as you tag them up beforehand, as long as you do any point of damage to the jockeys before they jump in, you will get the percentage from the jockey, too, and top of the peacekeeper. So this is just like a lot of percentage compared to the rest of the dungeon that these peacekeepers do. And that's why we see them, as you said, just pulling all these pe peacekeepers together and letting the, the jockeys jump in there. Now, of course, we don't only have peacekeepers in this section of the dungeon. Probably the two most dangerous mobs to deal with in this section of the dungeon are the Hired Assassins and the uh, Refreshment Vendors. Now, the Hired Assassins will cast an ability called Toxic Blade, which, if you let it go off, will give it a buff that applies poison to any target they hit. In addition to that, a little bit later than that, they'll start casting Hail of Fleshets, which also does ticking damage to the group, and if you let ticks get off without stunning it, it'll put massive poison debuffs on your entire group. Now, this looks kind of simple from both of those teams as we have zero deaths coming in and having a pretty smooth run but this is these pulls are actually very very difficult because as i mentioned before uh, you just need to single target those peacekeepers while trying not to kill any lower hp mobs around them but those lower hp mobs as you mentioned for example the assassins and the uh, refreshment vendors they have so many uh, crucial abilities to interrupt so you need to have your single target focus on the peacekeeper but at the same time you need to handle all the interrupts and the controlling of these mobs which is not, not an easy job to do at all right and we did see a lot of that bolstering coming out from method I and mean, they had two very large peacekeepers although they were on low hp you have to remember that because bolstering is exponential scaling well it could be a five percent but it could be a million hp which is a lot to deal with for a trash mob yeah, especially uh, the more bolstering, the, the less damage the tank can do as well, because of course he needs to be kiting. If he gets hit by any of those high bolstered mobs, even if they don't have a lot of HP, they're just going to do so much damage. So not only do you lose damage from the mobs having more HP, but you also lose damage from the tank having to kite, not being able to damage himself, the healer maybe uh, having to heal more, and so on. So we see Abrikidabra gearing up to do a big pull here. They've, s they've sapped two refreshment vendors here. Or I think it's a refreshment vendor and something else, and they're only killing the two off-duty laborers here. This is this is purely so they don't get two free bolstering stacks on everything in the group, because these off-duty laborers have so much less health than everything else. And as a DPS player, you're generally just mindlessly AOing things things down DPS brain, to <laughs> where you don't really have time to say, oh, that one mob I shouldn't hit that while I'm AOing everything down. So just super smart play there, making sure they don't get two free bolstering stacks, which would be 44% more HP on every single one of these mobs. 
Yeah, and they actually also triggered the reaping with those two maps, so that means they had the, this big pool coming in on top of the reaping, which is very, very efficient, um, killing the reaping maps with a big pool like that. Now, they can, of course, use their cooldowns to kill a reaping at the same time as uh, killing the trash group as well. Now, they only have to be careful on their drop really low because of this quaking here on top of all the other damage, but they, they managed to recover, hopefully, and then, uh, as I said earlier, just... Uh, having the mobs die at the same time is so important, which is more difficult if you have the reaping mobs there because there's so many nameplates. And you know, this is a real mob, this is a reaping mob. Uh, but these players are top tier players and they can definitely tell which one's which and try to not get any of the bolstering stacks. Yeah, that was a super dangerous moment from there. Like I said, quicking going out. Plus, I think they got a several, several ticks of hail of flesh that's going out. It's just difficult to find those mobs in the sea of nameplates. Fortunately for them, they do have several AoE, like get out of jail free cards in the form of the leg sweep, the ring and piece, as well as the moon, uh, I mean, and the rest of the druids knockback. Now, when we were doing this dungeon earlier, we saw teams not progress to the first boss until they were at 82 and 93% trash count, both of them. But it looks like, like uh, Abracadabra is kind of moving forward here. And so earlier as well, we saw them only go to the boss once they had their bloodlust, and both of them used the bloodlust for the first boss. Boss, but both of them, uh, both teams here, Method NA and Abracadabra, have still two minutes fifty under bloodlust. So we'll see if they actually pull the boss without bloodlust, or if they're still opting to uh, to do more trash. As the Abracadabra just pulling this um, one pack that stands in front of the entrance of the first boss. And they did pull a couple of extra mobs in. We've mentioned this so many times. Just pulling those three mobs together is very inefficient for the AoE damage of these groups. Like, for instance, for the Monk, maximum efficiency would be five mobs, since that's how many stacks they can get from their spinning crane kick. But it's good that they pulled extra mobs in. It's just more efficient. It's, it's good to get more trash down. And they are going to approach that 80% mob count here once this trash pack is dead. Yeah, I think uh, Method and I actually did the exact same pull right now as Abrakidebra is doing with those two Peacekeepers. And again, I just want to mention the rogues here just being so useful for this pull here because of bolstering. Because step is that true to see that makes the mobs not be in combat with you. So if you kill mobs around step targets, they will not, not actually get bolstered. Well, if you use other CCs, they, they will still get bolstered because you are in combat with them. Now, just the rogues having all this CC and all this control getting into this dungeon is so helpful here. Now, once again, we've mentioned this before, but they're waiting on their bloodlust to pull the boss. So they're going around the boss into the second portion of the dungeon. We saw the other teams before gently pick out the mine rats. If you don't do that, what they have to do is they have to actually focus all of their single target damage down onto the important mob here, which would be their earth shapers. That's, that's just super inefficient to do. It, it wastes time. It's not something you want to be doing whenever you're trying to progress fast keys like this. But this is going to proc the reaping. Yeah, definitely don't want to do something like that, um, especially because um, if you pull four mobs that have more HP and then like 10 mobs, then you can't single target them down, right? You can either, most most classes can only do single target or they do AOE, right? So if you have one big mob like the Peacekeepers before, then you can make sure you single target them down. But if you have four mobs that need to be targeted, then it's so much more difficult because you want to do AOE, but you don't want to kill the smaller HP mobs, right? And once again, at the 80% reaping mob there, since they procked those ahead, they can't shadow mill that tra that reaping trash. They have to make sure they deal with it right there because they're going to have to walk through that portion of the dungeon again later. Moving on to the coin-operated crowd pummel that we've seen both groups have pulled. Now, Method and I already have it at 40%, although they didn't proc that 80% reaping wave. Yeah, so Method and A is a little bit behind in trash percentage. They are 6% behind while they're ahead on the bus. They uh, both still don't have their bloodlust ready so compared to the teams before i do believe both of those teams uh, method and a and Abrakidabra are actually faster than the groups we've seen before because Abrakidabra are already in 82 percent trash and uh, they just got their bloodlust back up they did pop it on this boss uh, we'll see if method and a probably doesn't choose to use it because the boss is already almost dead yeah that's a little bit inefficient uh, once again for method and a. i'm not sure if that was in their plan or if they just went faster than before because using the using the bloodlust on this boss in, in association with 150 percent damage taken debuff is just it's going to get the boss down a lot faster than you normally would now once again this boss has a mechanic where the boss takes increased damage every now and then he will shoot out three bombs which have a stacking 50 percent damage taken debuff ideally you're going to shoot the first two bombs in the boss by kicking them and then it will refresh the duration of the debuff, so you'll hit one, two bombs, and then you'll wait a little bit, and then you'll do the third bombs, like we see JB doing on the left side there. Okay, so you actually missed one of the bombs there, but the boss died, so it didn't matter. Uh, we say it didn't drop really low from just the, the static shock debuff that the, the boss applies, but uh, JB is healing them back up, and now they're doing a pull here. I see the rogues actually 
using that CC to uh, CC the Earth Shaper. So they are doing a control pull, as we've seen before, kill the mine rats first, and then go and pull those higher HP Earth Shapers. This is definitely the advantage of, of being able to see people do the dungeon before you. They might not have been doing this before, they might have, we don't really know, but they could have been doing this trash pack somewhat differently found out, oh, we run that exact same team comp, so we can do that exact same thing, and now they're doing the exact same team as the team before them. This is just super efficient. Once again, you're making sure you're dealing with the lower HP mobs so that you don't accidentally AOE them down earlier to bolster all of the other mobs. Yeah, I think a lot of people are already used to this from uh, our last Apex Infest, our fourth Apex Infested. Um, if there were infested mobs, it's very similar to what they just did, right? They ran through, seceded the infested mobs, and pulled all the non-infested mobs, and later on they pulled the infested mobs together. Now, this is pretty similar to what we're seeing here with the bolstering, just seceding their high HP mobs and pulling the lower ones. This is actually a very dangerous pull. There's lots of things to interrupt here. The Earth Shapers will actually start casting Rock Lances at these low HPs at, at anyone in the group, and if one of those bolstered Rock Lances get off, it could be a potential one-shot, but we didn't see any of them go out there. It was very, very clean from them. Uh, I do believe they did shadow melt the, the reaping wave here on method and A side. They did proc it earlier and shadow melt it. Uh, now they pull one more trash back. Now we see both of those teams actually uh, got less percentage from uh, from the room before the first boss than the previous teams. And we see method and A actually using Blalas for this big pull that they're doing here. Yeah, so that that's actually interesting. I want that, that might have been actually planned. I mean, or it might have been like, oh, we have bloodless stuff, you want to do a big pull, guys. But actually, honestly, I doubt it. In, in competition play, you don't tend to actually just do things off the cuff like that unless you really don't have a planned out strat. So that was definitely interesting from them. I like that strategy from them. I want to see more of that. Now, we see Abercadabra still on the same trash. Now, both those teams are actually kind of even now. We saw Abercadabra was actually ahead beforehand, but now we have Method and A being a 94% trash, and they're already on their way to the next boss. Well, Abercadabra still has to finish off this trash, uh, and get the same percentage, if not more, than uh, Method and A here. Yeah, we've already mentioned the difficulties of this particular boss, especially without Bloodlust, whenever you're running a triple melee comp. These four Earth Raiders will fixate a random target on the group, and we even see one of the rogues getting two of the fixates there, which is pretty unfortunate. If they do melee you, they put a stacking physical bleed debuff on you, which, if you let it stack even to like four or five stacks, it's pretty difficult to heal through. Now, the best thing to do is obviously CC them together, knock them back, stun them, to make sure that they don't get anywhere. The problem is, since you're all melee, you don't really have any ranged player that can stand in place and let the mob run to him and AOE them down. So they have to kind of move together in a group, run in circles, make sure they're AOEing things down together. Yeah, so we, we've seen last groups who did the same dungeon, uh, specifically Mather EU, uh, pull this boss and just have the rogues use their AOE and just uh, try to nuke the ads down immediately because they're just so annoying for the melee. But we see for Method and A, they're actually alive for a pretty long time. And I feel like they're not doing a perfect job kiting the bus around because what you usually want to do is cut it in a circle so the ads are always behind you and you can still DPS the boss while not having to waste any time on running out of melee range or, or whatnot. But they actually managed to kill all the ads now. They got the new one spawned and they should be able to kill this boss. It does last a long time because it's a running pull, though. Yeah, it wasn't the most efficient way to kite the mobs around, but they get it done without any deaths, so we'll call that a win. In addition to the Earth Ragers that are constantly spawning throughout the fight now, the boss will do a giant frontal AoE slam. We just saw the tectonic slam. If you, if you get hit by it, you get stunned and take a massive amount of damage, so hopefully as a DPS, you aren't getting hit by that. But in, other than that, there really isn't that much going on in this fight at this point. Once you deal with the Earth Ragers, the, vi the fight is pretty much a tank and spake fight. Yeah, as long as you dodge your frontal, there's nothing really that can happen to you. Now we see uh, Evercadabra is on a boss now too. They're on 96% trash, while NA is on 94% trash. Now the boss HP difference is uh, approximately 25%, which does matter quite a bit on Tyrannical, especially on this boss because he has so much HP. But one thing to mention here is that Evercadabra actually will get their Blalas back uh, earlier than NA. So I'm not sure if this will make a difference for them. I'm not even sure if Method and A will get a Bloodlust out at all. It depends how fast they are uh, for the next bosses. Yeah, if Method and A does get their Bloodlust back, it's going to be probably near the middle or the end of the last boss. Just judging by time based on Shadow Mode to three minute cooldown, they're going to Shadow Mode to the first boss, then Shadow Mode again to the last boss. So probably a little bit better efficient use of Bloodlust out of Abracadabra, but I don't think this is just kind of an off the cuff thing, right? They must have timed this in practice. They're probably going to get their Bloodlust off at the end of the boss. Most likely. So uh, we see, of course, both of those teams need a little bit of per trash percentage still. We see actually th there's some sappers that are pulled on top, which probably won't trigger a reaping, but will get really close. Uh, I doubt they will choose to, to kill a reaping here. Yeah, they actually pulled the mini boss pack right before the boss there, which is, I mean, it's, it's a pretty difficult pack to deal with. It, I don't think it's the most efficient thing to do. 
But since it, I think th the reason they chose that pack is they have all of this room to shadow melt away from it, and that's very efficient for them. Yeah. Okay. So they did proc the reaping. They will go down, shadow melt the reaping away, and then they only have the bosses left. So the uh, method NA has two bosses left. Well, Abrakidera will also manage to down the boss, but they still need a little bit of trash. So either they choose to kill it right after the last boss, or they try to do a similar strat like method NA does and just shadow melt the reaping. But it seems like they're just running through to the boss at this point. Right. We see the same strat from this team as we saw previously. Both tanks run through first to make sure they get aggro on everything, and no, you know, errant casts go off on the group. Everyone will shadow melt and not get aggro on something. Unfortunately, on Method Nades, they do get one of the small Reaping Lobster, but that's not really going to be that big of a deal. They'll just pull it with the boss. Abrakidabra also pulls off the skip flawlessly once again, so th both of these teams are on the boss at the same time, and also, no deaths for both teams. Both teams have been super clean so far. This is going to be a race. Yeah, this is a very difficult dungeon, as we mentioned multiple times, and both of these teams playing so cleanly until this point. So they're both on the boss fight. They pretty much engage the boss at the very same time. The only difference we have is that Method NA already is 100% trash, so they do not have to kill anything else, while Ibra Kadebra, of course, has to get this last 4% somehow. Now, we did mention the Bloodlust difference, uh, but it's still almost 3 minutes for Ibra Kadebra, so they will have to use it on the last boss, as well as Method NA probably getting up at the end of the boss fight. Yeah, that's really, th that, like you said, that's really the only difference, the uh, the trash percentage and the bloodlust timing. So, once again, Rix of Flux Flame, cyclical boss, same thing over and over again. She'll, she'll target players in the group, and she'll put two puddles of goop down. And then after she's done two puddles of goop, she'll target players in the group and do two blasts that will move the goop off the platform. So this is all about area, right? You want to make sure you're standing in a spot, putting the goop in one spot to where you can easily move it away from you. Now, the one thing that is actually a little bit annoying in this boss fight is the quaking, right? Because there's a bunch of abilities this boss has where it actually really matters where you're standing. Not only do we have uh, this a cast that targets a player randomly, if you get quaking at the same time, you might displace or be in an out of spot and you don't put it exactly where you want it. And on top of that, you also have the magic debuff ability that uh, the boss applies to the closest two targets. Now you want to rotate the closest targets to be the tank and one other player who has a defensive or an immunity ready, right? You either want to cloak off the debuff, you want to karma or whatnot. Now if you get quaking at the same time and the people need to spread out, you might actually have the debuff go on the wrong player. So of course it is out healable, but it's going to be a lot more difficult then. And right, with this team comp as well, they deal with it so well. They've got two rogues with Cloak of Shadows available to just immune the debuff. And as well as that, if the monk gets it, he can just pop his touch of karma, which will just give him three more boss damage. Now, he might not have that available to him, because knowing Lighty, he likes using that karma aggressively for damage. He's probably popped it and stood in the goo for more damage. But it's just a possibility. Yeah, so we see the comparison in damage between those two teams is very close. So they pulled the boss approximately at the same time, and the boss also dies approximately at the same time. So both of those teams having very, very even damage. They have the same composition. They have uh, both zero deaths. So this is a very, very even race. Now, what matters is going to be how this last um, skip happens here from Method and A, because we saw from them before that one skip just didn't work out for them. Now, they do have a Shroud, which uh, usually no one should be getting in combat here, except for this skipping of the very last group here, who do have Suicide. So one of the members, usually the tank, has to pull the group to the left side so everyone else can walk past. And then, of course, we, we will see the Shadow Melt one more time. Yeah, that, that might have been a little bit early from nerf there. Usually what you want to have to have your do, uh, tank you do is stand there, tank them for a little while so that your group can get past, and then once your group is past, you, you jump in and meld with them. But it works out just fine for them. Nobody gets nobody gets stuck in combat, and they're instantly on the boss. Yeah, so Ava Kadeva did pull the boss a little bit early, which is what they needed, right? Because they, after this boss, or at the very end of the boss fight, they will have to pull more trash. So... Uh, they're a little bit ahead now. They do have the blood of strategy. They choose not to use it right now. They're probably going to use it for uh, after the intermission phase when the boss comes down again. Yeah, I don't know if using bloodless at this point would be t totally efficient because you might push the boss to 50% with it without uh, well, while still having bloodless up, and you don't want to use your bloodless on an immune boss. Yeah. You probably also don't want to use it on the add phase in this fight because the biggest portion of this fight after this point is going to be the 50 to 0. So using Bloodless on the 50 to 0 is the most important portion of the fight, and we're going to see probably both teams do it if Method and Aze comes back up. Yeah, and we one more crucial thing probably is going to be the intermission phase here, because as we mentioned earlier, you have those three pillars that you need to hit, but if you uh, actually manage to get the bus down earlier, it's going to be so much time saved. So we will see if uh, either of those teams is going to choose to do that, or if it happens for either of those teams, and we will also see what uh, what Abra Kedebra does with that last uh, trash percentage that they need, because all the trash around this area is actually very difficult to kill. 
Right, Abracadabra getting into the intermission phase about 8% before Method and A, so they'll be able to deal with these pillars in this trash a little bit quickly. A little bit more quickly. While you're in this intermission phase, you do have to deal with two of these Sky Scorchers, which will target random players in the group with a laser beam that your entire group needs to soak, otherwise that one person will take all the full damage by themselves, so... Buddy up, make sure nobody's taking full damage. And uh, other things to mention in this bus is, uh, we said this earlier, but both of those teams are running a full melee uh, setup, right? So we have both of the, oh, we see Swagfest actually going down for Abercadabra. So we have the first step coming in uh, from them, which means custom five seconds, and this is already so close. They did pop their bloodlust. That means he lost not only the five seconds, but he also lost his bloodlust, meaning he lost a lot of damage too. We did see them actually come out of the phase a little bit earlier, though. They only had to deal with two of the pillars instead of all three. They must have lost one of the more clones or something. But they are out of the phase more quickly than Method and Nea. They are, they are about 10% ahead. So it's going to come down to whether or not they can deal with that last 4% and the last 10% that Method has to deal with. Yeah, Method and Nea popped their Bloodlust uh, now as well. So they got the Bloodlust back up. Uh, I do believe Method and Nea is going to win because not only does Abercadabra need this additional trash, but they also lost those so five seconds. And we see Dr. J dying here. Uh, or did he just proc his cheat death? He just okay, he just proc his cheat death. It is a rogue after all. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, if Method and A just do a clean fall, does no have no deaths, then I assume they're gonna be ahead. I mean, unless they know about some random mob that gives four percent in this dungeon that nobody else knows about, I think yeah. the dungeon's pretty much over. I think Method and A has this in the bag as long as they don't catastrophically wipe in the last fourteen percent of the boss here. Yeah, I'm not sure if they had a different, if something went wrong in their route, or if they were actually trying to pull this last four percent. Because as I said, like all the trash that is around this boss is quite difficult, and they're not making use of their shadow melt or anything. So Moguls do goes down for Abracadabra. We're gonna see where they would go to get this four percent trash from. It also goes down for Method and A, and Method and A is done with the dungeon. So they were gonna yep. go into this pack and probably just kill the Sky Scorchers, but it wasn't gonna be enough. Yeah. Not enough for Abra Key Defa as well. So, game three to decide Method NA versus Abra Key Dabra, who goes to the semifinals. All right, let's see what we got here. I'm really interested to see what we get here. What do you think it is? Okay, so we mentioned earlier that uh, they're probably going to go left side to do this reverse strategy where they start off on the left side, they shot past these golems and go to the priestess. Now, they actually have Elsred and yeah, on both sides. We see Elsrad and JB standing on this ledge here. Now, what this does is that the Juggernauts, they do have an ability uh, that charges a, a random ranged player uh, and it does a lot of AoE damage around him, right? Now, if someone stands on this pillar, they will get targeted by the charge, but since there's no path available, they will actually just not do the charge at all. So that's why they can do these huge pulls here uh, without them being too dangerous because we have this spot here preventing them from the charge. Yeah, it's a little finicky, but once you get up there, it's it's definitely the safe thing to do. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, of a deal to be honest. The alternative is that your your healer will just stand outside of the group and dodge every single time just to charge. Now, this is another spot from Divine Field, another snap spot here. We see the rogues running ahead, popping their tricks on the tank, and running ahead and snapping the mobs to where the tank is on this pillar here, and they're going to be AoEing it down. Now, the big thing to, to focus on here is making sure they're dealing with all the explosives. Yeah, so explosive is one thing why it was so interesting that they hit so fast times in Atal, right? Uh, because explosive usually prevents you from doing very, very big pulls, because there's just too many explosives to handle. Now, both of those groups, though, have two outlaw rogues who are very good at dealing with those explosives. Not only can they do a lot of damage to them, but they're also cleaving off of the explosives, meaning that they actually do not lose any damage from targeting them. And we see this isn't exactly like an exact strat either. We saw two different things from here. Once they figured out that snap spot, Divine Field instantly jumped down, instantly pulled Rez on. They went on to their next spot, to their first boss. Method and A, however, went over to the left side with the two Sky Screamers, which will do an AoE fear if you let their interrupt casket off. Not necessarily dangerous mobs, but they, they decided to do that with their reaping. Yeah, it's interesting to see that those two teams have different strats. I kind of assumed that they're just both going to do the exact same thing because they were so close to the time trials. But it's uh, nice to see that both of them have a different strat, but they were just both very, very quick. Hmm, now Method and A is also going up to the right side. They blind the Honor Guard. You don't want to deal with those. They do massive AoE group damage. They're probably one of the worst mobs in the dungeon to deal with. If you can get away with not killing them at all, that's a great day for you. They're pretty much pulling every single non-Honor Guard mob here and AoEing it down. This is pretty crazy actually. Yeah, so we have Witch Doctors here, which are crucial to, to handle uh, because they do cast a blast that gets, like, a random player gets targeted by this blast, uh, Venom Blast, and it does a lot of damage. So usually uh, on a 45 setting, you need to interrupt most of those casts. Now we do have three melees 
plus a tank who can deal with them. And as we mentioned earlier, rogues are just very good at controlling this kind of stuff. So as long as you assign one rogue for each caster, they should be all right. And it's the same thing for each of the shield bearers too, right? They'll do a large AOE shield, which is only stunnable to cast. You can't knock it back. And since they have two rogues in the group, as well as a monk that can also leg sweep for one of the double casts, they, they have a very efficient way of dealing with the shield bearers as well. Yeah, so in first round, we saw, of course, Abakadabra chose to pull the boss instead of pulling the trash. And you might have noticed that Rasan didn't really run away like he usually does. So Rasan does have a fixate. Uh, the target is a random player that is uh, not in melee range, and it will fixate this player and chase him for a couple of seconds. Now, if the Rift Rasan actually reaches the player, he will eat him and does a lot of damage. Now, what we saw Abrakidebra doing here is actually Shadow Mouth each of the fixate or vanish. That means that the boss never moves. You have uh, uh, the most damage efficiency, pretty much, because uh, the healer doesn't have to cut, can do damage instead. The tank doesn't have to cut and can do damage instead. So you have the maximum efficiency by just removing that uh, ability from the boss pretty much. Now we saw Method and A opted to pull Volcal first, of course, which is a two-phase fight. Phase one, you have to make sure that you deal with all three reanimation totems, kill them at the exact same time that so that you can then unlock the boss, as we see they've done here, and move on to phase two, where he'll start rotting and filling the room with this goop on the ground. In addition to all of that, you'll also have to interrupt a cast that happens every 15 seconds pretty quickly, otherwise there'll be more rot in the group. But other than that, at this point in the fight, it's kind of like a patchwork fight. Just make sure you get the interrupts. Yeah, so we see Abercadabra is now on the trash that the Method and A killed before. They did actually choose to kill the Honor Guard, uh, which I don't think we saw Method and A killing that. And now they're probably going to do the same thing as uh, Method and A did. They are going to shroud past this trash because this is very dangerous trash, also inefficient trash to kill. So most, uh, most groups choose to skip this one with their shroud, and now they're also going to be on the second boss here. Yeah, once again, they're going to have to make sure that they split up the DPS effectively here and cleave all three reanimation totems down at the same time, while Method and A is just about to get the boss down here. Now, one thing to mention, teams definitely will never use Lust on this boss because he does damage to himself as well, so it's just kind of an efficiency thing. Why would you try to do more damage to a boss that will eventually kill himself? Exactly. So. Of course, we have the double shroud uh, in both of those teams, so they not only do they manage to skip to the boss, but they also manage to skip back because of this double shroud. And if they don't have a shroud ready, they can still choose to shadow them. So a lot of skip possibilities here coming in from both of those teams. Now we see Method and A uh, pulling the stalkers, which are patrolling in stealth with this group uh, that stands in front of the gate. Now this is kind of a difficult pull because it does a lot of da tank damage, and you also need to make sure that you focus the casters and interrupt them at the same time. But at the same time, the tank really doesn't have the ability to kite too much because of the shield bearers in the group. The shield bearers will occasionally do a shield bash cast, which will hit the closest target. So if the tank is kiting too much, it might just turn and smack one of the melee in the face, and now you're down to DPS and have to blow a battle res, or just wait for the DPS to be back alive once the trash pack is dead. So they're, do they're dealing with this very, very efficiently. This is a very similar pull to the one we saw earlier, where they were seeing the honor guards together. They just have to make sure they're stunning the shield bearers and interrupting the witch doctors, which they've done quite cleanly. Yeah, so Method and A also uh, triggered the reaping here, of course, they're dealing with the last few reaping mobs and, uh, until they continue on. Now, both of those teams had, did a really good job at dealing with Explosive. Now, Explos I think this is the first time we see Explosive in this tournament. So Explosive will spawn an orb now and then, depending on how many mobs there are, there will be more or less orbs, and you need to target them and actually attack them, because if you don't kill them in time, they will explode on the whole uh, group. Now, um, of course, the more mobs you have, the more explosives you have, uh, meaning that all those pools are actually uh, a lot for explosive. I'm actually kind of impressed that you barely ever see them because they just die so fast. You see the melees and the rogues just switch to them immediately and just kill them. So we saw Method and A once again, they're pulling the two Skyscreamer plus sword packs together, which is pretty dangerous considering the swords do a lot of AoE group damages if you're stacked up. But that was also perfectly calculated to hit their 60% reaping mark while they go into the th their second boss at Rezan. Yeah, so they jump down while uh, they trigger the reaping. Now all the mobs, as we see, coming down the stairs, uh, so they can kill the reaping on top of the boss. We've seen that a lot, that they try to trigger the reaping uh, at the same time when they're engaging a boss fight or engaging something else, so they're not wasting any time on killing the reaping by itself. So this is just for efficiency, having one more target to, to deal with or having a mob group to deal with while you kill the reaping, because reaping itself is not very dangerous and uh, it's not much you have to handle as long as you dodge and dispel the tank. And once again, they're using this, they're using this strategy that you talked about where if someone gets fixated, they'll, they'll either use their shadow meld 
or they're vanished to make sure that it doesn't actually happen. Now, obviously, there is one caveat to that. If it goes on a non-rogue player twice, they'll, they'll only be able to shout them out at once, so they will have to kite. And it looks like it went on nerf here, unfortunately, which means they will have to kite. Now, that does only mean that nerf doesn't get uptime on the boss, but considering how much single-target damage warriors actually can put out when they're able to DPS, that's a pretty big damage loss. Yeah, one more thing you have to mention, of course, is that if you cancel the fixed side with Shadow Melt or Vanish, then, of course, the tank gets hit by the boss, which it doesn't do otherwise. Now, this boss actually is one crucial tank mechanic, which leaves a bleed, as we can see right now on nerf, that does do quite a bit of damage. Of course, we do have a 45 setting here, so it's not buffed by that, and we know that warriors are quite re resistible, so that at least they pretty much not lose any HP from this ability. Yeah, and once again, another snap spot coming out from uh, from Abraki Dabra here. These little pillars in the side seem to be great spots. And one of the best parts about this spot is this completely nullifies the, the toxic AoE damage that toxic swords do. Usually when you pull sword packs, you have to make sure that you're very carefully spread out and so, th so that you don't splash AoE damage onto each of your players. And on top of that, whenever these sword packs are spread out, Explosives can also spawn pretty much anywhere in the group, so when everything's stacked like that, it makes it just a lot easier to deal with those mechanics. Most definitely, because uh, one risk of running triple melee, especially with explosive, is that you might not be able to kill the explosive if they spawn in range or if they spawn somewhere far away. Now, of course, you only have melee players, and they would have to walk there and kill the explosive, which takes a long time, and they will lose a lot of damage because they have to walk out of melee range. So the snapping mechanic and just dragging it, everything closer is just so good. Now we see Nerf actually almost die here on this wall that are coming out from Method and A. Now we're actually seeing them not snap it. I guess they might have not thought it was necessary. And they're also just instantly pulling it. These teams are actually just neck and neck right now. Yeah. Same trash percentage at the second there, as well as they're in the same spot in the dungeon. They have the same amount of bosses left. They have no deaths. This is just incredibly clean so far. And honestly, I mean, considering how far ahead of they were on other teams, I'm not really too impressed with it. It's just that they're going so fast. There's nothing special about their strategy other than maybe the snap spots that we saw from other teams. We're just doing it better. Yeah, they did tell me that uh, most other teams probably just uh, thought way too much about this whole snapping idea, right? Because we've seen both of those teams not using the snapping that much at all. They maybe used it one time. So uh, just playing it cleanly and playing it fast, doing those pick pulls, that is the key to just doing this dungeon really quickly. Now we see one very dangerous pull coming up. We have both teams having Bloodlust ready. And this big pull here that they're going to pull the whole room, which is very dangerous to do. Yeah, and Method A is also a slightly ahead on trash percentage. They procced their 80% reaping before going into this room, and I don't believe that you can shadow mode that because they're going to want to go back down afterwards. So they're planning on pulling all of this reaping into the AoE pack they're about to do, which will give them more AoE damage. And once again, it's just another efficiency. However, because they were ahead already, Abracadabra has already pulled the pack and has most of it at 50%. Yeah, so we... There's one thing to note here, you can see JB. Oh, we actually see Nerve die here, which is very dangerous. Oh my god, this is a full wipe probably coming out of Method and A here. I think they got a bunch of explosives uh, going off at the same time as Nerve dying. Uh, they got the rest up, but now we have the full team wipe coming in here. Now, Evakide on the other side, uh, they almost lost Dr. J. He's very low, needs to be healed back up. Uh, but if they pull up this pool uh, without any problems, then they're going to be ahead of Method and A by far. See, Jay was at 3% there, but his cheat hadn't procced yet. That's yeah. why Elsa wasn't even dealing with him yet. He, <laughs> he knew that, that, that Jay was fine. They do actually pull this reaping into the boss here, at the rest of the reaping that they procced from their 80% wave. Now, fortunately, there aren't any priestesses alive, so all of the blood pools that are on the ground are from the boss, so there's going to be no bamboozling there. But once again, going into priestess here, priestess is probably the easiest boss in the dungeon because over time, if you do the mechanics properly, the boss will just kind of kill herself. Yeah, so one thing I wanted to mention earlier before we had this wipe coming in from both teams is that there's also a spot where both of the healers can run to to actually just ignore the charge. So we saw both Alstrad and JB just go behind those stairs. There's like a small spot where you can stand where the charge just does not happen. Now, uh, of course, we see, as he said, Priestess, not a very difficult fight to deal with as long as you see the assets that are spawning because those ads they will walk towards the pools and if they reach them, they will actually remove the pools. Now, the pools are important, though, because uh, once the boss casts the AoE ability that dra either drains life if you don't have the, the buff, uh, the debuff, which means she will heal herself, or she reduces her HP if you have the pool debuff. So that's why it's very important to see those sets. And right, and you can see the pass-fail mechanic there. Whenever the red, the red lines go out, that means they did it properly. If you see the yellow lines go out, that means they did it poorly and the boss is starting to heal or not taking as much damage. Like we said, though, the boss goes down incredibly quickly. 
and they're moving on to the last boss, but they do have to deal with this last three percentage here. I wonder if they're planning on killing the trash pack first and shadow melting it, or just going straight up to the boss and coming back down. Probably shadow melting it, if I had to guess. Yeah, I assume they they can pull one of those um, sky screamers. They can pull them up and to see them with any sort of CC and just keep it throughout the whole boss fight. That's one thing they might be doing and just kill it at the very end so to dodge the reaping wave, or they choose to just. Uh, go back and kill it at the very end. It looks like they're going to go back and kill the, the swords that are in the middle pack after they kill this boss so that they don't have to worry about staying in combat. Going up to this last boss, oh man, this boss is, is going to be an interesting one. Fortunately, it's in a fortified setting, so they don't have to be in combat with this boss too long. But the big mechanic on this boss has to be the spiders that the boss spawns throughout the fight. It's just an area of denial throughout the entire fight. More and more spiders spawn, and your group gets less and less room to move around. However, the rogues able are able to both cloak of shadows and clear as much of the room as they possibly can. So I don't think that we're ever going to see them get to a point where they don't have to, where they don't have to worry about the spiders. But we'll see how this goes. Well, one thing to mention here as well is the spiders, they do spawn close to players, right? And once in a while, they will get bigger and they will fix it on players. Now, the good thing about having this, like, full melee lineup is that everyone is stacked up on the boss and everyone moves together. Now, you have all those spiders being kind of condensed, and there's strategies where you wait until the, the spiders are very, very close. So whenever new spiders spawn, they somehow uh, stack up if you move the boss properly. Now, we see them, of course, doing, uh, doing that and cutting the boss in a circle, making sure that the spiders are far away once they get big and start fixating people. And of course the other major mechanic of, of the fight is the soul rend cast that the boss does which will spawn a clone of all non-tank players in the group and you'll have to DPS them down. If you don't DPS them down they'll, they'll fixate on top of the boss and if they reach the boss they'll apply a, a pretty strong shadow debuff to everyone in the group which stacks. So definitely need to make sure you're DPSing them down but they, they deal with them perfectly. And yeah, now we see Method and I actually uh, did 100% trash here. They reached the last boss now as well but at this point, they're just so far behind because of this full wipe coming in. Not only did they lose so much time from the six staffs, but they also lost their bloodlust, they lost their damage, they had to re-clear the reaping and so on. So, this one crucial mistake, again, just like in Shrine, just cost them so much time. This is a really impressive run from Team Abrakidabra here. They just have to deal with this one last set of Soul Rand adds. 10% left on the boss. All they have to do is keep the tank alive, not run into spiders, and finish the boss. Now, this time, look at this time. Yeah. That's a time trial's time. <laughs> Most definitely. So we see both of those teams actually playing their time trial strat, I assume. Now, Method and A, if they wouldn't have wiped, they were pretty much had to head to Abrakadabra at this point. If they would have played this cleanly, I think both of these times would have been time trial times, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now we're going to see what they're planning on pulling for the rest of the trash mob. The Skyscreamers only do give 2% mob, mob count, so they're probably going to have to pull the swords in the middle pack as well. So we'll see if that kind of thing. It might be 2.5% might be actually, which would yeah. be the rest of the monster. Wouldn't be shown, yeah. Yeah, there we go, 100%. Yeah. Abracadabra takes it with a very impressive clean run, no deaths. Very impressive for them. 